sweetened with aspartame. And she was drinking fairly large amounts of it. Now, you could, you could speculate that perhaps the caffeine in the tea may have been a factor, but she had not changed the total quantity. She'd had this amount of iced tea for many years without manic episodes, without grand mal seizures. What was different was the aspartame. So I started looking at that, and it made sense that aspartame would lower the seizure threshold. That is, what we knew about the chemistry of aspartame at that point in time did point to the possibility that aspartame could, one, trigger a manic episode, and two, could lower the seizure threshold sufficiently for her to have a grand mal seizure. And that was the beginning. Then I found other patients like that. I wrote about it. And that was in uh, 1985, really two years or so after the introduction of aspartame into the market. Uh, I realized that something was going awry, but I couldn't quite figure it out. And then after several years putting, amalgamating this experience and patient input, and it's very important that you listen to your patients because the great Dr. Osler said, listen to the patient, they're telling you what's wrong. I realized that the common denominator was the use of uh, aspartame products. And under various trait names, particularly NutraSweet, Equal, Crystallite, and so forth. I was primarily using NutraSweet, lots of it, because I was a big coffee drinker. It was decaffeinated, I was taking care of myself. <laughs> I mean, there was just all kinds of things that, you know, the diet sodas, the, you know, I used to uh, eat Jell-O all the time, or, you know, Cool Whip and gum. I used to, you know, eat chew gum constantly back then. Um, came home and decided I was going to be the good diabetic. I needed to be here for my child. Um, I was going to drink the diet drink like crazy. I drank Crystal Light tea. I'd switched from brewing my own tea to Crystal Light tea. And so for years, I went on thinking what a smart person I am drinking Diet Coke instead of regular Coke. And, and, and also, I carried it into other things as well, so that when I would sweeten my tea, I'd sweeten it with... Uh, with equal. And so when the uh, low-cal Kool-Aid hit the market uh, in, I think it was April of 1983, I started using it. I would have a drink with a Diet Coke. During the day I would drink Diet Coke or, co or coffee, decaffeinated, all day long. I was never without one or the other. I drove 10 states. I always had a thermos of coffee with me, very liberally treated with NutraSweet. I started out for doing blood draws, and um, I, I did the blood draws. I like talking and everything, and so that was a good area for me to get into. I was always hyper and all that, and I would drink the diet so it was like crazy there because we had it at our disposal all the time. And so the further and further I got on, and then um, I did the Armed Forces Emergency ser Services with the disaster. We work with um, people overseas during war wartime. I grew up in a funeral home, in one of the oldest funeral homes in the South. Um, I didn't meet my husband until I was like 35, 36. And um, we went on to have a child. And my weight just went way out of and in the meantime, I had lost an eye in 87. I didn't meet him until 98. And um, I was told in 92 I had diabetes. Well, I tried staying off the sweets and the Coca-Cola and, you know, drinking the diet drinks on and off. And uh, I was a briefing attorney for a federal district judge, John H. Wood. The U.S. courthouse in San Antonio is named after him. And... Uh, then, after serving as his briefing attorney for two years, I was appointed by Bill Sessions as assistant U.S. attorney for the Western District of Texas and uh, served in that capacity for a little bit over four years. And during that time, I was the president of the Federal Bar Association and very active in uh, legal matters and things like that. Had I seen the chemical formula on this product, I would never have touched it. You know, the, the poisonous effect of methyl alcohol and, and its methyl esters are, are well known. And uh, within a day or two of my starting to drink it, not only 
did I feel the deterioration in my body where I couldn't swim anymore and I didn't have the balance that I had and then I was short of breath from a heart failure type of problem. But my wife saw all this much more objectively than I did and she was a nurse and she said, Jim, get off of this. This is killing you. It's destroying you. Well, I was diagnosed with an autoimmune disease back in 93 called lupus SLE systemic, which I had been dealing with. It was very severe to the point where I lost my job and eventually my insurance because over 40 doctors who saw me over a year's period kept doing one test after another and every test came back negative. I've had someone since 1983. I can go back to as far as 1983 and possibly even before that but I only remember doctor's offices and, and you know, the um, hospitalizations and things like that since 1983. Around, I'd say January of 2002, I started getting dizzy. I would go to the dryer to go take clothes out and fall down and not know why. The reason I found out I had a brain tumor was I lost my voice during pollen season of the year 2000, or 98, excuse me. And um, in 98, my voice never came back from the pollen hoarseness that happened to me every year. So I went to a specialist at a local hospital here in Atlanta, and I said, all my friends' voices have come back, mine's gotten worse. And he went down my throat, and he said, well, your left vocal cord is completely atrophied, and it's been my experience when I see a condition like this that there's a brain tumor someplace that causes that. Also, the vision um, having spots, and I and I couldn't see. And I, I I literally I stopped driving because I did not feel comfortable behind a wheel. My endocrinologist told me that I have the most likely have multiple sclerosis. So he sent me to a neurologist. The neurologist told me that, yes, I do have a multiple sclerosis. I had been having double vision, and my doctor scheduled me to have an MRI. And uh, we were waiting on the results, and I'll never forget it. It was, oh, maybe a week or two before Christmas. And uh, the doctor called, and I, I was just you know, ready to hear, well, you know, we couldn't find anything. Well, instead, he said, you have a brain tumor, and it's a rather large brain tumor. And within a couple of days, I had gone from being a two mile a day swimmer to having such a toxic cardiomyopathy that I could hardly climb the stairs to my apartment. Over the next six weeks, I went through all of the personal hells of methyl alcohol poisoning and the neurotransmitter depletion uh, from the aspartame's phenylalanine content, and eventually ended up with a picture of Lou Gehrig disease. I still had a lot of pain. But she said, well, you'll live with pain. It's part of, even though it's in remission, you're going to have pain. So I went to Tampa, finally found a rheumatologist that she had referred me to. And oddly enough, he did the same blood test and said, you never had lupus. You have advanced fibromyalgia. <laughs> and I said, I just give up. So he said, well, I just don't think you ever had lupus. But for whatever reason, you're able to do what you're doing because of what she gave you. So let's just go ahead and treat you as if it's in remission, but I'm gonna treat you for, for fibromyalgia. But detail is very, very important. You have to get spellings name, birth dates name, everything. And with me being diagnosed with the neural hearing loss, which has gotten significantly worse with it, I've been um, checked the last three years every six months, and it's gotten, gotten a lot worse. And now I'm taking, I have the two hearing aids that I have to have. I took the ice pops out thinking they were just the regular ones that I had been eating earlier. And my mother-in-law had taken my little one over to her house. So my husband and I were in movies and we were going to have a date night. You know, just night out, you know, night to ourselves. And I pulled out the pops and went on to eat the four, three, four of the pops, the aspartame pops. Well, this was on a Saturday night. By 4 o'clock Sunday morning, I was digging holes in my hands from the itching. I was bleeding. I looked like something out of a Vietnam camp from the bleeding. The doctor explained that one of the very probable side results would be a loss of short-term memory. Well, uh, I later learned that 
it had done a little bit more than that with me uh, in that it ruined my legal career. About then I tumbled.